chocolate pomegranates and uh, protective layers. All right, here we go. Okay, no nonsense tonight, man. I'm for real. Look at that. That's a sarcoplasmal reticulum all day. All right. Ready? Write this down. Never forget this. Ever. Ever. Are you ever going to forget it? Your brain and spinal cord float inside your skull. Your vertebrae, your spinal column, floats inside your vertebral column. Did you know that? Guys? I bet you you did. All right, so where's the picture? Here it is. So you have the protective layers of the brain and spinal cord. You better write this down. And the protective layers of the brain and spinal cord are called the meninges. Right there. It says it. Say yeah. All right. Now watch. If you recall from our discussion of the lymphatic system and the immune system, I explained to you that the brain and spinal cord do not have a lymphatic system. So they need to be extra protected. And what does that extra protection is the meninges. And going from outside to in, these are the protective layers. You have the thin layer that covers the brain and spinal cord directly. That's called the pia mater. Pia mater. Say yeah. And watch. Suspended above the pia by these protein little girders, these little protein supports, is the next layer called the arachnoid mater. The reason it's called the arachnoid mater is these protein girders under a microscope look like a spider's web. Ooh. Does anybody like spiders? Good. Do you like spiders? No. Good. Yeah. Arachnoid means spider. You got me? See? Okay, now watch. Directly above, uh, below, directly below the arachnoid mater and above the pia is the subarachnoid space. Very important. And the subarachnoid space, I'm coloring in yellow and trying to stay within the lines. That space right there. That subarachnoid space is where cerebral spinal fluid circulates. Who's got me? Who's following this? <coughs> now watch. Then you can see, watch. Do you see this kind of darkened area right here? Right above, right above the arachnoid mater, you see this small darkened area right here? You see that? That's called the subdural space. So it's a space between the arachnoid mater and the next layer, which is the dura, dura, tough, durable, dura cell. You got me? And the dural layer lines the inside of the skull and vertebral column. It's a real tough layer. Say yes. So the dura lines the inside of the skull and vertebral column. And it's very, very thick and tough. Durable. Yeah, dura. Say yes. Now watch. The central nervous system does not have a lymphatic system. So if you get buddy bacteria in there, you get a condition called meningitis. You've heard of this? Meningitis is very, very bad. Bacterial meningitis, particularly bad. Very bad. Viral, usually self-limiting. 
Tell me you got that. All right. And we talked about this. Where is cerebral spinal fluid? Where is it? In the subarachnoid space. And you write this down. Cerebral spinal fluid circulates around the entire brain and spinal cord. The entire brain and spinal cord. Mida, where does cerebral spinal fluid circulate? And if you get this right, I'm going to give you this clicker thing. Not even kidding. And then during class, you can just go. Anytime you want. What was the question again? What was the question? Where does cerebral spinal fluid circulate? Right. Where does it circulate again? The brain and spinal cord. The brain is entire brain and spinal cord. Say yes. Okay. Write this down. Never forget it. Watch it. I'm going to write this out for you. It's so important. How many lumbar vertebrae do you got? Five. L1, right here. The true spinal cord, the thick spinal cord, ends at L1. Say yes. But as you can see, this, what this, what is this, turquoise? This is the subarachnoid space, and cerebral spinal fluid circulates around the entire spinal cord. Tell me you got that. Now watch. When they do a lumbar puncture to get a sample of cerebral spinal fluid, they want to make sure that they don't damage the spinal cord. So to limit the damage to the spinal cord, they will do a spinal tap between, this is one, two, three, four, between L3 and L4. That reduces the risk of potential damage to the spinal cord. Say yes, because cerebral spinal fluid circulates around the entire spinal cord. This little part of the spinal cord that embeds into the coccyx, right? Your little tail. We used to have a tail. We could wag it too. Not even playing. So watch, this is called the cauda equina or horse's tail and it is embedded into the coccyx and it prevents the spinal cord from wobbling around. Tell me you got that, guys, you're following this. So when they do a lumbar puncture, they do it between L3 and L, um, L4 typically to reduce the likelihood that you're gonna damage the spinal cord. All right, now watch. Here's your spinal cord. Looks like a banana, don't it? Okay, watch. Here's the dura. You got me? When they do an epidural, do they inject that spinal medicine into the cerebral spinal fluid? Sarah, it's called an epidural. An epidural is injected into this area right here called the epidural space. Tell me you got that. It is above the dura. The dura is the most outer lining of the meninges. Who's following this? So if you have a good anesthesiologist, when they put that needle in, they inject that medicine without damaging any of the protective layers. And some teachers and some anesthesiologists are better than others. Don't you wish you had a good one? Teacher, I mean, when they poke that, 
they will poke through the dura and they will poke through the arachnoid and when they pull that needle out cerebral spinal fluid will start leaking out tell me you got that what's the function of cerebral spinal fluid what does it do better write this down one of the functions of cerebral spinal fluid is to cushion and protect the brain and spinal cord. Without cerebral spinal fluid, your brain would weigh a lot. Your head would be just bobbing all day. Yeah? Who's following this so far? All right, so if they do a bad job and they poke a hole in the dura and the arachnoid mater, when they take that needle out, cerebral spinal fluid will begin to leak out of that hole and your brain will begin to rest on the base of your skull and you will get a nasty headache. Did you get a nasty headache? Yeah. Yeah, that sucks. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? Ugh. But the headache went away like that. Here, watch. Let me show you why understanding this is important. This is a person who is getting what's called a blood patch. A blood patch is where they draw 20 cc's of your own blood. Blood outside your cardiovascular system will do what? Clot. And it will form scar tissue and it will form, it will form a patch. It will cover up the hole. So they put the spinal needle in there. Then they take the blood that you drew out, that they drew out from you, and they inject it in there into the epidural space. Who's following this? And here's the sad part. Watch. And what they'll do is they'll ask you as they're pushing the blood in, did the headache go away? Do you still have the headache? Do you still have the headache? And as soon as that headache goes away, then they stop pushing blood in because they know they sealed it off and cerebral spinal fluid ain't leaking out anymore. Tell me you got that. Here's the sad thing about that. These people have to rock, walk around with that spinal needle in them for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Mary wears that coat to cover it up. <laughs> look, look, right there. Yeah. And you know what you want to do? You just want to go up to him and just go, boing. <laughs> I have a question. So why did they make me lay on my back for like three hours after that? Uh, they didn't want you to be uh, moving so that blood would stay in one spot so it would form okay. that uh, clot in that area. Okay. That's why they do it. They had you lay down for a while, right? Yeah, for a while. Right. Time. Watch. Flat watch. On my back. That's right. Flat on your back. Yeah. Right? Because watch. Here's your little head. You, you have microcephaly. <laughs> watch. If you sit up, the cerebral spinal fluid by gravity is going to be at the base of the spinal cord, so that's going to make the headache worse. By laying down, that will keep this amount of cerebral spinal fluid in the subarachnoid space consistent so the headache won't be as bad. So what they'll do is they'll have you lay down on your back, right? Mm -hmm. And then what they hold is that direct pressure over that area will seal off that hole. If it doesn't, then they'll do the blood patch. Say yeah, mm -hmm. right? And you ambulate home with a little tiny head. How many people follow that? Okay. So when they do an epidural, they don't inject the medication into the cerebral spinal fluid. They inject it into the epidural space, which is above the dura. Yes? So when they block the, the, the blood, so does the brain just automatically fill back up again? Or it, it yeah, because uh, we're not there yet, but you're constantly producing cerebral spinal fluid. Constantly. And I'll show you that in a minute. Do you want to watch it till the end? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So why do they just leave it hanging like that? It's just kind of cool it's looking. <laughs> you know? Sometimes, like, the doctor, they'll paint their lunch bag on it and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Don't you just want to go up there and just... Yeah. I want to pull it out. Okay. Person's got a nice tan, though. All right. Let me show you this real quick. You can watch videos. I don't care. What's Billy Madison? Billy Madison? Yeah, what's that? With Billy Madison, that MSU, I think. Oh, yeah. Smiley face. I showed you that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've been zooming now dumb right yeah. <laughs> listening to it. Yeah. Wait, I want to know what the one below that is. <laughs> this is how I sound. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is that Miss America one? What? I don't know if you can hear it. Wait. You see? Wait. How come you can't hear it? Oh, you can't hear it. I got this thing. You can't do it. That's when she asked about if some people don't know where America is, so they need a map or something like that. Well, why don't you go home and watch it? You know, you complaining. Plan if a brand new truck ran over you. Okay, wait. All right. Wait. Oh, Spinal Tap. They always get the movie. Wait, I want to show you. Oh, here. Watch. This is a guy getting Spinal Tap, right? Also, he's got plumber butt. <laughs> right there. The other thing I'd like to point out, watch watch the nurse. Watch the nurse. She checks her cell phone. I'm not even playing. Watch. Watch, where is it? Okay, watch. It's coming up. I'm gonna find it. That's how sickening it is. That's why I have this video, is to watch the sickness. Okay, wait. Okay, watch. Oh, man, I passed it up. You give me two seconds. Come on. Watch. Watch. She's going to check it. That's why they're doing the video. Not to do this. Just to catch this nurse checking her cell phone and get her fired. You're going to humor me. Watch. I'm going to explain this, why that's important that you know that, about checking your cell phone. Wait, I'm going to show you. Oh, man, did I miss it? Okay, here it comes, I think. Knows how she's kind of eyeballing the butt crack too. <laughs> Maybe she's trying to take a picture of it. Or something. Okay, it's coming up. Okay. Wait, I know you. I'm wasting your life right now, but talk. What? Wait, it's coming up. Um, you know why they have to lay on their side? Because it doesn't compress the side. That's close. Do you get a spinal tap uh, during a routine physical? Yeah. No, people are sick. All right, forget it. But she did check her, her cell phone. No, that's to clean the area with ba that's banded no, I'm talking about the reason that they lay in that position is so they can clearly see the spine so they know exactly Yeah, but why 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 don't they have them sit up? Because it's retarded. 
Yeah, what's that? Well, he, he could flinch. Hey. When they did mine for my. That was for blood. They had you sit up, didn't no, they? No, for the C section too. When they yeah, did it, right, they right. They will. There's, no, okay, wait. This is where she does it. This is where she does it. Yeah. I found out who that was too. I reported her. I did. Not even kidding. She's going to do it. You're waiting for her to do it too. I forget it. You could have just watched the whole video. Yeah, well, leave me alone. You know? Everybody's yelling. So why do you lay down? I ain't there yet. Here we go. All right. Write this down. You're going to need to know this. Don't this look like Deborah Messing? From Will and Grace a little bit? Look at the celebrities we had. Tiger Woods with pneumonia. Kenny, right? Who else did we have? Glenn Close with a respiratory problem? Yeah, Neo in the Matrix. I mean, this is a star-studded class. You had, like, another one. Kenny, Kenny uh, the bladder? Yeah, there was uh, Tiger Woods with pneumonia. Here we go. All right. I explained to you. I know I did. The brain has ventricles. Ventricles are chambers, right? And in this case, the brain has four ventricles. Better write this down. The ventricles in the brain are two lateral ventricles. One third ventricle <laughs> and one fourth ventricle. They're called the third and fourth ventricle. That's easy, right? Why do you have two lateral ventricles? Because you have two hemispheres of your brain. We know that just intuitively, right? Okay, now watch. Embedded in each ventricle, embedded in each ventricle is a specialized group of cells called the choroid plexus. Watch, I'm going to move Deborah Messing over and show you the choroid plexus. You got me? And each ventricle has a choroid plexus. You got me? So you have, and the choroid plexus filters the plasma of the blood. The function of the choroid plexus is to filter the plasma of the blood and produce cerebral spinal fluid. So what color should cerebral spinal fluid be? Clear. Should you have any red blood cells in cerebral spinal fluid? White blood cells? No. So the consistency of cerebral spinal fluid is that of plasma, which is clear, minus the big stuff, white blood cells, albumin, red blood cells. Are you with me? Better write this down. Better not pout. The choroid plexus, choroid plex I, in an average adult, make between 450 and 500 cc's of cerebral spinal fluid per day. You got me? But at any given time in the average adult, there is only 150 cc's circulating around the brain and spinal cord. So if you make 450 to 500, and there's only 150 cc's flowing around it, where does that 300 or 350 cc's go? I don't know. Magic. So watch. Here we go. And the function, the function of cerebral spinal fluid, you need this, number one, I explained it. It's to cushion and protect the brain. How many people have watched football? Okay, watch, watch. When football players have helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact, boom, like this, 
their skull stops, but because their brain is not fixed to the inside of the skull, the brain keeps moving. So the brain, this is the inside of the skull. When the skull stops, the brain keeps moving and you, it's like the Ryan Braun bobblehead doll. It will bobble back and forth inside the skull. That's how concussions occur. Say yes. Because these guys are bigger and stronger than they've ever been before. They're faster. They're bigger. They're stronger. The head ain't changed. You can't lift weights to, to get a bigger, stronger head. So the amount of energy that they put into those hits is what's calling, causing all those concussions. And that's why you're having these football players who are killing themselves. And they're not shooting themselves in the head. They're shooting themselves in the chest to preserve their brain so they can look at it. Because even that... Uh, that uh, Hernan Aaron Hernandez, the guy's like a gazillionaire, and yet he feels like he has to kill people over drug money. There's got to be something wrong with the dude, right? And that is that repeated concussions. And these people, they get messed up really, really quick. So when you're in a car accident, the same thing. And know this, listen up, because this is true. If you have, you were knocked out, right? You were knocked out. You have a concussion. No two ways about it. If you have lost consciousness, you have been concussed. And not only that, you get concussed in the front of the brain, and then because it bobbles back, you get concussed in the back of the brain. So you got Dean Bramage all day. Then you end up going, what? Have you ever seen the movie Mm-mm. Really? Right, now watch. That's why they got the little tent there after a guy's been, you know, he's hurt and they see the head to head. They go in there and they do the little percussion, concussion, uh, concussion protocol and say, no, he's, he's out. And the bottom line is, is that it's going to take somebody getting killed, right? Back in the 1960s and 70s, right? Ray Nitschke was six foot three, 235 pounds. He was a monster. Ray Nitschke? Anyways, right? <laughs> Thanks. You know, the cinema time here. Yeah. So watch. These guys now are huge. And not only are they big, they're fast. And know this, energy is one half mv squared. You square the velocity. You understand that? So the faster these guys run, the more energy they impart and the more damage they do. Look at uh, Cam Newton. That guy's like six foot five, 265 pounds. That's a, that's a defensive lineman 20 years ago. The guy's a monster. But his head is the same as everybody else's. And you smack it enough, um, something's going to end up happening. But watch. If Are you going to say that to a kid, look, you can't play um, professional football because you might get a concussion. For these guys, they're making $15, 20000000 million a year, right? And they're going to say, I'm going to take that chance. I would too. Haven't they changed the design of the helmets? Yeah, it, it ain't going to help. It ain't going to help. These guys are way too big. Anyways, tell me you filed that. All right, this is what I want to show you. You better get this because it's on the final. And if you don't get it, you know what I'm going to do? Mark your whole life wrong. You ever have your whole life marked wrong? It's awful. So the function of cerebral spinal fluid is to cushion and protect the brain. The second function, second function of cerebral spinal fluid is to remove metabolic waste from the central nervous system. And I'll explain how that works. All right, now watch. This is you, this is unique. Where does the cerebral spinal fluid circulate? Where? What, what space does it circulate? The subarachnoid space. So watch, here's the subarachnoid space right here, this little orange part. 
all the way around the brain and spinal cord. Are you with me? Now watch. You have the arachnoid mater right here, right? And it's connected to the dura. But the dura mater in the brain folds on itself. And it forms a pocket, kind of like a pita pocket. You with me? This little pocket where the dura in the brain folds on itself is called the dural sinus. And the dural sinus contains venous blood. Who's with me? Now watch. If you look, look real close, right here, you see the subarachnoid space, and then you see these little indentations into it? You see that? These are called arachnoid villi. Arachnoid villi are essentially drains. Drains that communicate with the subarachnoid space and the dural sinus. So this is where excess cerebral spinal fluid is drained off the brain and spinal cord. And the dural sinus contains venous blood, and all that venous blood in the dural sinus ultimately gets dumped into the right side of the heart. Did you follow that? Guys? Yes or no? Yes or no? Oh, you want me to repeat this? Watch. Cerebral spinal fluid, excess cerebral spinal fluid, is drained off from the subarachnoid space into the dural sinus. And all the blood in the dural sinus, which is venous blood, gets drained into the right side of the heart. Say yeah. All right, watch. In some people, as they're developing in the womb and then in the other womb, Guys, it's just, I'm wearing thin on you. I get it. Raj, some of these drains, these arachnoid villi, are either absent or malformed. Are you following? So watch. If you remember, the bones of the skull and the baby are not fixed. They got that, remember, don't touch the soft spot. Remember that? So as they circulate cerebral spinal fluid, that arachnoid, uh, Choroid plexus will continue to produce cerebral spinal fluid, but it won't be adequately drained. So the pressure inside that brain increases and the skull bones begin to expand and they develop a condition called hydrocephalus. You've heard of this? So what they do for that, if, and usually the kid comes out retarded because the pressure in the brain squishes the brain and cuts off blood flow to the brain. So brain development is not very good in someone who's had hydrocephalus. So what they will do is they will put in what's called a ventricular shunt. Did I explain this? Mm -hmm. A ventricular shunt is a tube that goes into the ventricles of the brain, goes underneath the skin of the skull, and then usually is drained into the peritoneal cavity or the small intestines, and that drains off excess cerebral spinal fluid. And there's also a pump on there, like a little valve that you have on there, like you prime a lawnmower. And then if you ain't got nothing to do, you can pump your kid's shunt. Like on a Friday night, hey, pump it. What's that? You can make a box of popcorn, you know? Hey, let's pump your shunt. Can I show you? Can I tell you a real quick story, just real quick or no? Anyways, about 15 years ago, I'm working at the company and they hired this new salesman, right? And I can't walk up to people, hey, you got any problems, right? So he comes up to me, he goes, Tim, I just want you to know that I have a ventricular shunt. I have a congenitally narrow cerebral aqueduct and um, I have the shunt. And I go, where's the pump, right? And he had, it's so sad because he had a beautiful head of hair too, right? And so he shows me, and I'm like, it's right here. I'm like, okay. So he works there for six, seven years, never has a problem. And one day I'm talking to him, right? And all of a sudden, 
his eyes roll in the back of his head, and he's passing out, and I catch him, right? So I go, come on, I want one. And then, like, the owners of the company and everybody, they're gathering around, and I'm like this around his head. And they go, Tim, what are you doing? And I go, I'm pumping his shunt. Because <laughs> 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 <'Cause> some, <laughs> sometimes protein can, uh, debris can get uh, caught up in there and can clog that shunt, and watch. If shunt's been in a long time, the immune system puts like scar tissue around it so it doesn't move. So if they have to put another shunt in, they don't take the old shunt out, they just put another shunt in. So there are people who walk around with two, three, sometimes four shunts in their ventricles. There you go. Right? But if you'd knew, known where the shunt was, you could have pumped the shunt. Right? Yeah. He actually woke up, but then he had to go back. Uh, and if it fails once, they'll always put another one in because if no one's around, you're dead. Right? Because it will begin to compress the brain and it will cut off blood flow to the brain stem. You'll stop breathing. Your heart stops. If you're a goner. The sad thing, man, he had a beautiful head of hair, too. And then, you know, they have to cut through it so scar tissue doesn't grow hair. So we had, like, I was like, dude, like, I should have had one. You know, it doesn't matter now. <laughs> Tell me you got that. Okay. All right. Now watch. Do they do lumbar punctures for no reason? Like, I'm had a physical, yeah, they did a lumbar puncture. No. That means you are sick. And they want information about what's going on in the central nervous system. And most importantly, they want to determine if you have an infection in the central nervous system, meningitis. You got me? So they have to get a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. But the other thing, the reason they lay them on their back like this, and they try to get them as level as possible, that's because when they put the needle in, they actually measure the pressure that cerebral spinal fluid is exerting in the brain and spinal cord. That's why he's putting that little manometer on there to actually measure the pressure. So if you have them level, the pressure in the lumbar region is equal to the pressure in the brain. That's why they do it. And they'll actually have a level on the table and try to keep that spine as level as possible. They, uh... Okay. Did I explain that? Okay, that's good. All right. All right what else we got to go over? What? Who's got the final? I see it. I can't even come close to reading this. They were in my. You like bent them? Yeah, I did. All right, okay. Okay. All right, and, and I went over the year, right? You just have one more question. Yeah. yeah. I didn't go over the year? No, well, you started to, and then, like, nobody class was like. No one was paying attention, like, kind of like tonight? No, Oh, like, let, yeah, me, let me, let me, let me, let me go over yeah. the, uh, can I go over the year in the eye and what I expect? Sure. Is that okay? All right. And I went over the basic structure of the neuron. Yeah. Yes, I did. And how nerves communicate yeah. with one another. All right, let me start with the eye. Okay, ready? Just so you know, on your lab final, I'm gonna have this picture up, because I'm gonna be watching. Okay, let's look at some external anatomy. First of all, where's the lacrimal gland? Upper eyelid. 
it's in the upper eyelid, right? Watch, and I explain this to you. When you wash a window, do you start in the corner here? You start at the top. So the lacrimal gland is located here. And when you cry boo-hoo, oh yeah, oh yeah, right? The tears will actually be drained into the nasal lacrimal duct, and that's why your nose runs when the little kid cries that he didn't get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip for Christmas. How many people cry because they didn't get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip? Kelly, did you cry? No. Did you want the Barbie? The Malibu Barbie? With the pink, the pink Corvette? Alrighty. Okay, so watch. You got your eyelids and you have eyelashes. Some people have really nice eyelashes. Some women got really, I can't believe how thick their eyelashes are. Right? It's like, they're like huge too. You're kidding. Oh, oh. Oh, they're called eye wigs, right? Are you ready? Now watch. Eyelashes are just like hair. They're hair follicles. Obviously, they don't grow as much as hair does. Got to get my eyelashes cut. Right? But they do have the same structure as skin. One of the things they have are sebaceous glands to secrete that little oily mixture. And sometimes bacteria can get in there and you get a sty. That's what styes are. Yeah? Okay. And... Watch, and I explained to you this before, maybe you'll get it. Which, which air contains more moisture, hot or cold? Hot. So in the winter time, you got to keep your cornea moist so the lacrimal gland will produce tears and they'll drain and that's why your nose runs in the winter time. If you tell that to your neighbors, they'll be like, damn, that person's smart. Don't you like that? Just so you know, too, in movies, you can't cry out of just one eye unless you've had a stroke. So when there's a real sad scene and only one eye is crying, that's made up. That's fake. Do you understand that? I had one student, she did really bad on her final, right? And she starts crying, but no tears are coming out. I'm like, that's a fake cry. Like she was looking for sympathy and I said, next. What? Did I tell you this? Listen up, because this is absolutely true. I live by a CVS and when you guys are all done, right? That night I go to CVS and I buy a binky and a big can of Gerber rice. Because that night, if I happen to put a bad grade next to your name, I sleep like a baby. No. So last semester, at this semester, I'm leaving. It was the end, right? There was a box of Gerber rice. You got to have to mix it up and a binky. What? Here's the other thing that just really kind of weirds me out, and you've seen it. You got that three, four, five-year-old kid that's got that tympanic membrane booger that covers his nostril completely, and he just breathes, and that thing just moves in and out. You know what I'm talking about, right? Doesn't that weird you out? I'm like, dude, don't you know you got a big honking freaking booger covering your nostril? There you go. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay. It's going to get good. <laughs> Stop. I'm going over the eye. Now, no, I'm not even going to look. Where's those glasses? <laughs> those are worthless. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. What did you do to them? Did you I, I think I sat on them. Look at that, man. <laughs> okay. Good, I can't see it. All right, here we go. Come on, guys. This is a cross section of the eye, right? What, write this down. The eye is divided into two chambers. 
everything in front of the iris and behind the cornea is the anterior chamber of the eye. Everything in back of the iris and including the retina is the posterior chamber of the eye. Who's with me? All right. Is the cornea alive or dead? It's alive. Does it have a blood supply that goes through it to feed it? It does. So you can see little red blood cells as you're studying. Oh, yeah, look a little anemic. Can you? No. So you better, you better understand this. You better get this. The cornea is living tissue, but it's made of clear translucent protein. And the function of the cornea is to bend light. It is to refract. Refract means to bend light, to focus it. And in normal people with normal eyes, the cornea is round. In some people, the cornea is football shaped and they have astigmatism. Sometimes astigmatism can affect both cornea, sometimes just one and not the other. So what they do is they do a procedure called LASIX, laser assisted incisional keratotomy. Have you heard of it? And what they do is they will take a laser and they will cut incisions, radial incisions in the cornea to reshape the cornea. And that improves the vision. You what? Eight of them? There you go. Why, did you have it done? Why? Yeah, it only takes like a couple of minutes, like two, two and a half minutes to do it. How much? 90 seconds. How much is it? Yeah, I know. Good God, those guys got to be rolling in dough. Rolling. That's what I should do. Okay. All right. Now, in some unfortunate people with the, uh, uh, the astigmatism, the football-shaped cornea, if you look at it, some of the cornea actually have laces and an NFL insignia. <laughs> okay. Okay, who cares about that? Okay, I'm going to come back to the cornea in a little bit. Now, let's look at the iris first. The iris is like the aperture of the eye. If you get this right, I'll be so proud of you. What is the iris made out of? No, a tin. <laughs> and um, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's made out of protein, but what kind of protein? Come on. I didn't say it in the video. I had to say it in the video. It's made out of muscle. Right? What are the two things muscle can do? If you look, if you look at anybody's eye, the inner portion of the iris is a different color than the outer portion. And that's because you have radial bands of muscle and then you have circular bands of muscle. And it is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So watch, when you are scared, what do you want your pupils to do? Dilate. So the circular bands will relax and the radial bands will contract, making your pupil bigger. What? Did you, you understand that, right? And the same way, when you go to sleep, like in this class, right? The circular bands will contract and the radial bands will relax. And what basically determines your eye color is the amount of melanin present. The darker your skin, the darker your eyes, typically. 
Tell me you got that. And watch, where did we all originate from? Racine. <laughs> we all originated at the equator, right? Warm. So as you move farther and farther away from the equator, the skin becomes lighter and the eyes become lighter. Tell me you got, like you can always tell a Southern Italian from a Northern Italian. Southern Italians have darker skin, darker complected, darker eyes. Northern Italians tend to have lighter skin, lighter eyes. Say, yeah. It's, not, it's a general thing. Tell me you, you got that. All right. Okay. Now, whoops. Look at that. It's like a paint by number set. Don't it look like a fish? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Watch. Here we have the lens. The lens is directly in back of the iris. And the lens is made up of concentric rings of translucent protein, clear protein. Now watch, this is really important. The lens is suspended in back of the iris by these little suspensatory ligaments, these little protein strands. And these little protein strands are then connected to muscles. These muscles are called ciliary muscles. And ciliary muscles, what are the two things that muscle can do? Contract and relax. So instead of your eyes moving in and out like a telephoto lens, right, to look at something near or far, wherever you are, See the looks I'm getting. <laughs> I'm getting that GoPro next semester, right? Well, I'm trying, but they won't let me teach all my classes online until I teach one class. Like it's like a trial period, so I'm gonna be really good, right? Say yes, students. <laughs> Anyways, watch to. The ability to accommodate, meaning to look at something up close and focus, and then immediately look at something far away and focus, it's achieved by these ciliary muscles. So they, because they're connected to these little protein strands, the muscles will contract and relax and actually change the shape of the lens. Tell me you got that. That's how we accommodate. Now watch. Anybody have eggs over the weekend? You did? Good. 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 I made my kid breakfast and he woke up at the crack of 1.30 on Sunday. Right? So watch. When you put the egg in and the pan isn't uh, warm, the albumin protein is clear. But then when you heat it up, it denatures and becomes white. The protein that you have in your lens is the protein that you die with most days. But if it becomes broken down and denatured, you get... A cataract. Say yeah, that's a cataract. Now, watch. Are there blood vessels in the cornea? Good, no. So how, is the cornea alive or dead? It's alive. Better write this down. There are specialized cells that are embedded in the ciliary muscles. Those specialized cells are called ciliary putty. Get it? Ciliary putty. Ciliary bodies. And they secrete a clear fluid called aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary bodies and then will travel through the pupil and it will nourish the cornea and remove metabolic waste. Say yes. Guys, who's following this? Anybody? Okay, watch. Here's a ciliary body. 
produces the aqueous humor. It flows through the iris and nourishes the cornea. Yes? That excess aqueous humor is then drained into these little canals called the canals of Schlem. The canals of Schlem is actually, he was like the fourth stooge, Schlem, remember? The canals of Schlem drain that excess aqueous humor and send it into the venous blood and that gets returned into the right side of the heart. Say so, yeah. In people with diabetes, especially diabetes, those little canals can get blocked. So the ciliary bodies continue to produce aqueous humor, but it can't adequately drain. Who's following this? So you develop a condition called increased intraocular pressure. That's why when you go get your eye exam, they, they, the puff of air, that measures the pressure inside your eye. And intraocular pressure increases, it can lead to what? Glaucoma. Say, uh, do you want glaucoma? No, you want to go to Gateway. I'll explain it in a minute. Now watch. The treatment for glaucoma is one of two things. Tetrahydrocannabinoid. The chronic. <laughs> Cuckoo for dopo puffs. So it's not unusual for a ophthalmologist to write a prescription for one big fatty. And have... <laughs> Right? So THC actually reduces the production of aqueous humor. That's how it works in treating glaucoma. Because in glaucoma, you have a overproduction of aqueous humor, or not necessarily overproduction, but the inability to drain it. So that's how it's used as the treatment of glaucoma. It also dilates the um, pupil so that it can flow a little easier and it doesn't build up as quickly. That's why when you, uh, so I've heard if you, you know, take a little hit, here, then you go into a bar afterwards, it's like you got to have like a welding shield because the lights are so bright. You ever experienced that? Yeah, it's going to raise your blood sugar because you get the munchies. <laughs> right? So there's another one they can use. Uh, they use beta blockers, and beta blocker eye drops will reduce the production of um, aqueous humor. Tell me you got that. All right? So just so you know, I'm down with IOP. Yeah, you know me. You guys are, you guys are really kind of falling apart here at the end. Maybe I'm falling apart. It never ends well. I'm a starter, not a finisher. It's a story of my life. That's why I try to go over the hard stuff in the beginning. Right? I can see really good with these things. I can clearly see one big fatty. Okay. That's what your mind's on, huh? No. I'm on, my mind's on making futures. Here we go. Ready? Okay. Watch. Let's talk about the posterior chamber. You got me? Guys, here we go. The posterior chamber of the eye has a thick gel, clear gel called vitreous humor. Vitreous humor, it's like a kind of like a jello that isn't quite done yet. And it's clear, it's translucent. And that helps maintain the shape of the eye. And basically, um, sometimes that you can get like protein debris, collection of protein where it will solidify and you get a condition called uh, floaters, right? Have you ever had that? Where in your field of vision, right? It like, you'll see kind of like a dark spot there and that's that little floater 
and that's the protein debris. And this vitreous humor circulates relatively slowly, so it sometimes takes a while for you to get that floater out of your central vision. Yeah, have you've ever experienced that? I have. Yeah, I never have. And why? And I teach at a technical college. You don't get them. Tell me you got that. People with diabetes routinely get these, and that's one of the reasons their vision is so poor. Right? Now, can I just, I think this is cool. How many people went deer hunt? You went deer hunt without studying? Yep. <laughs> Just not yesterday. Yep. I wish. Yeah. I can imagine actually you bringing your test textbook up there. You know what? I think it's so unfair, deer hunting. They should like corner off a part like the your hunting area, and guys should have to wrestle the deer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then like the deer kicks your ass. Well, oh well. You know you shouldn't have been messing with them, right? But what do you do? Here, you throw an apple out there, and then the deer comes up, nom, 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 and then you shoot it with a high-powered rifle. How fair is that? Huh? Oh, really? Still, that's unfair. Give them a bow. Have it put in between their antlers, you know, and bam! Yeah, I don't know. You know what are really good? Those deer sticks? Those little hot deer sticks? Oh, that's like crack, man. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. I was up, I got a place up north, so my sister's boyfriend's a hunter. Just real quick, and I'll get back. And he brought those deer sticks. I sat in in my place, right? And they're all, all, all by the fire, and I'm just sitting there in the kitchen eating those things. Like I was on a, like a drug addict. Where up north? Mauston. It's like 30 miles north of the Dells. Oh, I only left. Oh, no. Not me. I can't drive because people make me crazy. Okay, here we go. What was your I was born on a day, just not yesterday, when she was telling me she brought her book up there. Oh. That's an N. Oh. You know what? Here we go. Watch, let me get through this. Okay. Watch. The most important tissue in the eye is the retinal tissue. The retinal tissue is where the rubber meets the road. This is where photons of light get converted into electrical impulses and then transmitted to the occipital lobe of the brain where they're interpreted into visual stimuli. That's not pretty good with the glasses, man. Right? Okay, now watch. The retina has two unique cell types. It has rods and cones. Rods are used for dim light, dim light, and they only see in black and white. Cones are used for sharpness of vision, sharpness of vision, and they see in color. So if you, there are basically four cone types, the four basic colors of the spectrum, right? Or is it five? What are the colors of the spectrum? Green. Red. It's four, right? Five? Okay. No, orange ain't. No, orange ain't a color of spectrum. Orange is a color of a spectrum? Primary colors. Blue, green, and red. And then, right, cone types, 
right? And then how you put the blue, green, and yellow or red together determines the colors you can see. So if you're lacking one of the cone types, you're going to be colorblind in that particular color. Say so yeah. All right? Now watch. This, I think, is the coolest thing ever. What's this? Yeah, that's a Christmas tree. It's on fire. Watch. You got how many people had physics? You had physics? Rock on, Curly. So you know a little about optics, focal points? Here we go. When you look at something and the light is bent and it is focused on your retina, the image is actually on the retina is upside down. Your brain actually turns it right side up. Tell me you got that. Now, watch. Let's put you on and this stuff's exciting. What time is it? Okay, we got time. Watch. Here's the fovea. Better write this down. The fovea has the greatest concentration of cones. And remember, cones are for color and sharpness of vision. And this is when you look at something directly. When you look at something directly, you are focusing that image on the fovea. So the best way to look at something, to see it, the sharpest image, is to look directly at it because the fovea has the greatest concentration of cones. Say yes. As you move out into the periphery, there's less cones and more rods. That's why with peripheral vision, it's difficult to distinguish color and sharpness of vision. And in the dark, cones don't operate very well. So the darker it is, you see stuff in black and white. You can't distinguish color and you can't make out images very well. That's why I wanted to bring up the deer. How many people have ever seen a deer in a headlight, right? In the back, if you see somebody like you're about to kill somebody with your car because you're texting, if you look at them and they're looking at you in the headlight, it's red because you'll actually see the retina. In aminals who live and run around at night, they have in the back of their eye a thing called the tapetal lucidum. The tapetal lucidum looks bluish purple, and this allows the aminal to collect more light and see better in the dark. So only aminals that are mostly nocturnal have that tapetal lucidum. Isn't that cool? Well, fine, be that way. Question. What? Right, that's the retina you're seeing. Yeah? Do you want to look at that? I'll have to cut somebody's eye out. Develop the tap at a lucid? No. No, you have to be born with that. There's some people, I think, in, um, I think in Zion, that um, they actually have... Um, they're born with the tap of the They actually have it. So they can actually see better in the dark. And the reason they got that tap of the was from reading the textbook in the dark. They were so consumed with it. All right. Let me explain this, and then I'll give you a break. All right. We've got to get through this stuff. Watch. And I have to do my job. Here we go. There's an area in the retina called the optic disc. Write this down. The optic disc is where the optic nerve, the retinal artery, and retinal vein exit the back of the eye. Optic disc, optic nerve, retinal artery, retinal vein exit the back of the eye. This guy right here, this guy right here, here it is. This is the optic disc. There are no rods and cones in the optic disc. So everyone should have a small black of area in their field of vision. Do you have a small black area in the field of your vision? Do you? 
Now, that's because the occipital lobe is able to actually interpolate what you see and fill in the missing pieces. I was expecting more. Maybe I should have said that at the first part of the class. You would have been like, oh my God. You probably would have vomited Bob. Yep. You can actually see that. Tell me you got that. And if you've ever had a field of vision test, you've ever do that, do that field of vision where they flash the lights and you got to click the clicky thing. They're actually testing for that blind spot. So they're flashing lights and you can't see it because there are no rods and cones. Yet your field of vision is completely full. I think that's cool. You don't think that's cool? All right, fine, bunch of haters. Okay. Uh, did I cover all the stuff? Okay. Yeah, I did. I covered the eye stuff. All right, take a break. Wait, I'm going to find that part of the video. <laughs>